the order to abandon ship was given at 5 p.m. For most of the men, however, no order was needed because by then everybody knew that the ship was done and that it was time to give up trying to save her. She was being and that it was time to give up trying to save her. She was being crushed, not all at once, but slowly, a little at a time. The pressure of 10 million tons of ice was driving in against her sides, and dying as she was, she cried in agony. Her and dying as she was, she cried in agony. Her frames and planking, her immense timbers, many of them more than four feet thick, <coughs> screamed as the killing pressure mounted. And when her timbers could no longer stand the, the strain, they broke with a report like, report like artillery fire. <laughs> then there were the sounds of the pack ice in movement, the basic noises, the grunting, and the whining of the flows, along with an occasional thud as a heavy block of ice collapsed. But in addition, the pack under compression of other sounds, many of which seem strangely unrelated to the noise of ice undergoing pressure. Sometimes there was a sound like a gigantic train with squeaky axles being shunted roughly about with a great deal of bumping and clattering. <coughs> to each fresh wave of pressure in a different way. Sometimes she simply quivered briefly other times, she reached in a series of convulsive jerks, accompanied by anguished outcries. On these occasions, her three masts whipped violently back and forth. As the rigging occasions, her three masts whipped violently back and forth. As the rigging tightened like harp strings. But, but most agonizing for the men were the times when she seemed a huge creature, suffocating and gasping for breath. Her sides even against the strangling pressure. Her sides even against the strangling pressure. The general feeling of relief at being off the ship was not shared by one man. His name was Sir Ernest Shackleton, and the 27 men he had watched so ingloriously in their stricken ship were the members of his imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition. The date was October 27, 1915. The name of the ship was Endurance. The position was 69 degrees 5 minutes south, 51 degrees 30 minutes west, the Arctic Pacturus Weddell Sea, just about midway between the South Pole and the nearest known outpost of humanity, some 1,200 miles away. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good <laughs> morning, dames and gentlemen. On Arnhem, I Sir Alfred Dancing, the Bible in the book Endurance, Shackleton Incredible, Shackleton's Incredible Voyage. So, I will tell you that the scriber of the Arnhem has been in the past, so we will try to make it. Die goeie nie is, ek vertel graag vir jy bykie meer van Shackleton en die slechte nie is, ek het opdracht gekregen om het in Engels te doen. Ek het vir Dion gevra, maar glas water wat ek hier ergens gekry het, en hoop uit vir so'n knertje wodka om gegooi. Maar ek sal probeer to my English friends, so if my vocabulary or my grabber lets me down, please bear with me. The title of this morning's talk, Sir Ernest, Shackleton, one of the most remarkable explorers of all times, with specific reference uh, of specific emphasis on his epic expedition uh, of specific emphasis on his epic expedition to Antarctica, 1914 to 1916. Now, who was Ernest Shackleton? Uh, he was an, I would say, Anglo-Irishman. His family were from Irish origin. Uh, he was one of ten children. His family were from Irish origin. Uh, he was one of ten children. There were two boys and eight girls. Born 15th of February 1874. He was the second eldest. He grew up in a secure and a happy home. And it's interesting to read that uh, from young days, uh, from young days, 
he just had a charm with women, and I suppose having eight sisters, uh, it needed to be like that, but it's quite interesting to read also that all his sisters adored him. So he was quite a hero from, from his young years. Um, his father was, in the age of 31, he turned to medicine, studied medicine, the family had to relocate to Dublin during these years of study, and then to London. So Ernest Shackleton grew up mainly in London. Now, uh, Dr. Shackleton hoped that his son would follow him in the medicine uh, career. His childhood day said, I'm going to see. So after school, he did what he said he was going to do, and his father helped him to get a berth on a square rigger uh, tall ship uh, called the Houghton Tower. Uh, now, just for those of you who have not attended my previous trip, uh, is what we call the old ships of the 17, 18, 1900s, quite often with three masts, sometimes four or five masts with a square sails. So this ship was also one of these old tall ships. Um, he worked on that ship for around about five years, uh, sailing all around the world. Uh, and then in 1900 came the announcement that there was to be a national Antarctic expedition. Uh, the aim was scientific, and not, although not said specifically, the aim was also to see how far south they can get. The leader of that expedition, the le then uh, Lieutenant Robert F. Scott, now many of you will know the name, he was the guy who some years later, 11 years later, uh, had that attempt to be the first man to reach the South Pole. Now, Shackleton also applied for this expedition, now, Shackleton also applied for this expedition, and he was accepted. Now, this expedition, as you've heard, was around about 1900-1901. Now, to put it in, into perspective, you will also recall it was the same time, more or less, of the Anglo-Boer War. You also recall it was the same time, more or less, of the Anglo-Boer War in South Africa. And it was quite interesting to read, as you read about this expedition, how the whole story around the Anglo-Boer War, War also played a role. <clears throat> With the war dragging out, there was quite... And they needed something to lift them up a bit again. So this expedition was advertised uh, very patriotic, almost imperial. Uh, and it was stated in many papers that they hoped that the race to the South Pole will be won by the first naval power of the world. So there was some quite some... The ship was the Discovery, built in England, although it could have been built in Norway for less than half the price, but a bit of British pride again. Um, it was a bark, about means three masts on the foremast and the main mast square rig sails, on the aft mast forge of steaming and steam engines. So she also had a steam engine. Built in Dundee, after sailing from Britain, uh, Shackleton made a note in his diary. He wrote that she steered badly, too much sail aft and too little sail forward. Now the effect of that was the ship will always have the tendency to turn into the wind. So you have to correct with the wheel all the time. We call it a, a weather helm, turning into the wind. So it was not the best sailing ship. But they made it to Antarctica and they headed for the Ross Sea. Um, now, if we talk to photo of him, photo of the discovery on the ice, beautiful painting of discovery, and just for the interest of it, in the background you will see the mountain. It's an active volcano. The name is Mount Erebus. Now, that name will also <coughs> ring a bell. The name is Mount Erebus. Now, that name will also <coughs> ring a bell. Uh, Erebus was the ship, one of two ships, Erebus and Terra were the ships of Ross, who did exploring to Antarctica a few decades, decades before uh, Shackleton, and this mountain was named after uh, his ship, Ross's ship, and, they, and this mountain was named after uh, his ship, Ross's ship, and they, uh, uh, Erebus. So this uh, painting is of the ship uh, of Shackleton, no, no, of Scott, anchored on the foot of uh, Mount Erebus. Now, they sailed into the Ross, named after Ross the Explorer, 
and they kept to the west of the bay, hoping to find a spot where they can anchor and from where they can do their expedition over land to the south. There was no suitable anchorage, so they keep on traveling to the east along the ice barrier. Now, just to explain, sailing into the rock, you will get to a place where you can't go any further. Solid ice ahead, the so-called ice barrier. And in this instance, in Ross Sea, it was called the Ross Ice Barrier. Now, it's always or quite often hard for people to, uh, and the layout of the land, we all used to maps, flat pieces of paper, at best, if you look at the, at the globe, the art hole, uh, Antarctica is always hidden somewhere at the bottom where we can't see it. Now, if you can imagine, we've now turned the globe, the art ball, and we're looking from the south. Now, if you can imagine, we've now turned the globe, the art ball, and we're looking from the south. South Pole, Antarctica, right around it. Uh, just as a point of reference again, the peninsula going up north there, away from the south point. Remember now we've got the south point, so everywhere is north. That's north, this is north, this point. Remember now we've got the south point, so everywhere is north. That's north, this is north, this is north. <laughs> everywhere is north. Uh, bear that in mind. Now to the north from here, this is the Whale Sea. You see a peninsula running north. The Palmer Peninsula, that is the one going up towards the southern tip of Southern America, Cape Horn. That is the one going up towards the southern tip of Southern America, Cape Horn. On this side, we get the Ross Sea, and there is the Ross Ice Shelf, the barrier. So they could get into the Ross Sea, sailing more or less on the western side, sailing more or less on the western side, towards Ross Island. All right, then they went all along the ice barrier, all the way to King Edward Peninsula, it's over there. They couldn't get a suitable landing, so they turned around, and they went all the way back, and, in, and they went all the way back, and in, at the end they stopped at Ross Island again. Uh, and from a point there, which they called Hut Point, they started with their planning for the southward a journey over the ice. But at that time, it was already late summer, uh, so it was quite clear, and that was the planning from the beginning, that they would overwin overwinter there, and then in the spring, start with their journey uh, to the south. Uh, while there, uh, Captain Scott, Lieutenant Scott, captain of the ship, uh, instructed Shackleton to take a party ashore, polar trekking over the ice. So we went, and what he did, and which was later uh, came out to have uh, been of major value, he went to the mainland and he climbed the mountain, he and his uh, men with him, Mount Hope. And from the mountain, attempt to see what, what is lying ahead. Is there any possibilities of a route? But of course, remember at that stage, nobody had, had any idea. So they climbed Mount Hope, and from Mount Hope, they could see a mountain range to the west from there where they were standing. And this mountain range went all the way down to the east of that relatively flat land. So at that stage, uh, the idea was born that that could be a possible route to get to the South Pole. The Scott expedition had a few major uh, some of which is actually hard to understand, but is explained in the books which I've read. Uh, it can be contributed to the British uh, approach or idea at that stage that nobody can teach them anything. <laughs> uh, that nobody can teach them anything. Uh, the, the knowledge was there. So they could have gone to the Norwegians for example, to get some advice on trekking over snow, but they didn't. So they went on this uh, expedition. So they went on this uh, expedition of theirs without the correct food. Now at that stage there was no knowledge about vitamins yet. And as you all know, vitamin C is essential to combat scurvy. Uh, but they didn't have that knowledge. Many of the explorers across the world to stay healthy 
you must live off the land. And other expedition, expeditions uh, killed seals and ate fresh meat and so on and so on. This British expedition took salted meat uh, with fat to make it sort of edible uh, and dried biscuits. In that first winter before the expedition over the snow even started, many of the men, including Shackleton, already had scurvy. So it was quite a bad start. During the winter, Shackleton was put in charge by Scott to train the dogs. Shackleton knew nothing about training dogs. It was a complete disaster. Uh, not one of the men could ski. <laughs> they tried to learn themselves to get along skiing, but they were complete amateurs as far as skiing was concerned. Um, but uh, they had guts. The health was planned for around more or less 90 days. It was about 1,500 miles to the South Pole. So if you make a quick calculation, you can work out that must be around about 16, a bit more than 60, 16 miles per day. Quite a high target to achieve. With the dogs, but what they did, they put all their sleighs in tandem behind one, one another. And all 19 dogs were then harnessed in front of this train, which was also not the right, right way to do it. The Norwegians had many sleds, but you put it sledges, eh? Sled the Norwegians had many sleds, but you put it sledges, eh? Sledges. Uh, with each one having his own pack of dogs. So that didn't really work well either, but they, well, they carried on. Um, I must make mention of the fact, well, I have mentioned that. Shackleton already I make mention of the fact, while well, I have mentioned that Shackleton already had first signs of scurvy. Apart from that, he had other health problems as well. He has complained, or he has experienced chest pains, short of breath sometimes, but he never wanted to consult a doctor. Uh, the theory is that he was worried that he may get some negative diagnosis and he wanted to avoid that at all cost. But he was already coughing and not that good when they, when they left. Um, what they then did is along the way, they left depots with food. This 750 plus miles, leaving, leaving uh, depots with, with food for the return. But it soon appeared that they are not going to make the targets. Not one day or very seldom they reached 16 miles quite often, uh, or most of the time, quite a bit less than that. Uh, by the, I just want to check the date here, December, January, uh, only two dogs were left. Uh, now, now bear in mind, that was, it's hard to say, but it was not only bad news, it was good news as well. It's hard to say, but it was not only bad news, it was good news as well. A dead dog was fresh meat for the men. So that was part of their rescue on the one side. Um, they carried on and they reached 82 degrees 15 south. They reached 82 degrees 15 south. By then they realized that they had to turn around if they want to get back alive. They also realized that the way back will be a race against time and a race against starvation. Uh, they made it to the first depot and after that they made each depot just about in time. Um, now when they got back to the ship, Shackleton was not in good shape and Scott decided to send him back. Now send him back how there was another ship in the morning and also back by Scott uh, Shackleton was not pleased at all. Uh, the reason that helped, yes it was so, but the actual or the real reason was a bad relationship between Scott and Shackleton. The two didn't get along. Mm -hmm. Shackleton went not feeling well about the whole affair. Back home he had to make ends meet again, so he started lecturing, he toured around, tell, tell the story of their expedition, earning some money, but finances were never, never Shackleton's good point. Finances 
when Nevin, Nevin Shackleton's good point, and he battled to keep things going. Uh, he was a good speaker, and his characteristics was was positive, uh, typical Irishman, cheerful, optimistic, good nature. Uh, but the concerns about his health, good nature. Uh, but the concerns about his health was always there. Um, now I wish to quote Roland Hunter. Now Roland Hunter wrote a biography about Shackleton, about 700 pages, but a very, very interesting book, uh, which I've read just as a matter of interest. I've been on a Mediterranean training trip for a month, less than a month ago. And I put my reading stuff on that voyage, and what I tell you this morning is a lot which I've read while sailing the med. Now, Roland Hunford said, the voyage of the demons of wounded pride, fear of time running out, and a hunger for revenge. Satisfaction would only come from a return to Antarctica and to outdo Scott. So Shackleton was planning to go back. And I have just say that once you've been there once, you always want to go back. Um, so Shackleton was planning to go back. He then started organizing his own expedition, the so-called British Antarctic Expedition of 1907. Uh, he was determined expedition of 1907. Uh, he was determined not to repeat uh, the mistakes made by Scott, but sadly he made his own mistakes. Uh, the object was to follow up the discoveries by the southern sledge journey between him and Scott, follow up the discoveries by the southern sledge journey between him and Scott and two other guys, but he would try to achieve a much higher altitude, to get closer to the pole, and yes, of course, first prize would be to get to the pole. Now, there was a bit of a complication. Scott was in charge of the previous expedition. Sort of wasn't entitled to, but he sort of claimed the Rossi, Ross T, as his territory. And he forbid Shackleton to go back to especially the western side of the Rossi. He in fact said not Rossi at all, but that was quite ridiculous. So Shackleton have left on the sledge journey. Uh, but that complicated matters. The basic mistakes Shackleton made, still not an experienced skier, but in my view, the major mistake they made, he then didn't take, uh, but instead, he took ponies, horses, <laughs> um, which was a major mistake. Um, they also took a motor car. <laughs> now, that was in the very, very uh, infant stages of motor cars, but they took a motor car a few meters progress and put it back on the ship. Didn't work at all. He also had too little time. He had seven months to prepare for this expedition, which needed actually more closer to two years to plan. Uh, in his rush, the best ship that he could get and could afford was that number 40 years old, only 300 tons. A tiny little ship. Um, but that's the best that he could afford. That is the Nimrod. Uh, not bad, but way too small. He then planned to not only reach the same plan, to not only reach the South Pole, but then also to cross Antarctica. From the Ross Sea all the way to the Weddell Sea on the other side, the Nimrod would sail around and pick them up there again. That was his uh, his big aim. Uh, his big aim. When they left New Zealand, they sailed from England to New Zealand, took in, took in uh, stocks there. When they left New Zealand, the number of was terribly <coughs> complicated. Um, a free board, now, free board is the distance from the sea level, from the sea level, from the water up to the deck, was just a little more than one meter. <laughs> 1,25 <laughs> meters of freeboard. The deck was crammed with cargo, ponies, <laughs> the motor car, and, char and uh, charcoal for the steam engine. 
Even so, there wasn't enough coal to burn while they would have been in Antarctica, let alone the return, the return voyage. So he organized for another ship to tow them to Antarctica to save coal. No. Uh, he then planned to sail again into the Ross Sea, but then to the east. Uh, the Ross Ice Shelf again stopped them from going further south, turned east all the way to King, e King Edward la Land, uh, didn't find any suitable anchorage, so he was also forced to turn back to the western side, the actual no back to the western side, the actual no go area. But he then stopped at um, Cape Royds. It was not as good as the spot that uh, Scott had, but that was the best he could do. So he then started planning his approaches from Cape Royds. could do. So he then started planning his approaches from Cape Royds. Uh, strong winds uh, made it very hard to offload the cargo. The captain of the ship, Captain England, was very nervous, and he more than once uh, lifted anchors and he more than once uh, lifted anchor and fled out of the bay and it was took a lot of persuasion from Shackleton's side to get him back to Cape Royce to offload the rest of the load. Uh, I think they went in and out for at least four or five times before everything was I think they went in and out for at least four or five times before everything was off the ship and then it was already 18th of February. So the summer was close to an end. Um, after the Nimrod left, Shackleton started with his preparations. Shackleton started with his preparations. It was not winter yet, so he realized they can still do something out there. So he sent an expedition of uh, six men to climb Mount Erebus, which you've seen earlier. Uh, the six men went. It's quite a high mountain. They had not only very heavy tents to carry with, so ill-prepared, but five of the six men reached it to the t uh, made it to the top. Uh, one man was left behind for the last thousand meters or so, and then returned with him, so at least all of them came back. Uh, they then uh, established at the height of... Now, how was it done these days? They used a hypsometer. A hypsometer is the stilled water that's boiled, they take the temperature at what it boils, and that determines the height. <laughs> and that was also quite an achievement to get to the top of Mount Erebus. Um, they died. And his doctor, Dr. Marshall, uh, was well prepared for that, fed the men the men with uh, fruit uh, that he cooked and took with in flasks. Um, they ate a lot of fresh meat, quite often raw scurvy away. From 17th of August, they started with sledging, and what they did is they started traveling south and putting out food for the long journey that was to come. Uh, they did that for about 100 miles of the total distance of 750 miles. The sledge journey started from Cape Royce for the south. Four ponies, each harnessed to a sledge. Uh, <coughs> the other sledges were dragged by the men themselves, on foot, not on skis, on foot. They were walking to the South Pole. Um, it was interesting, uh, there's a foot to the South Pole. Um, it was interesting, uh, there's a footnote in this book, which they are fun, that I found quite interesting. A horse's hoof on the ground, on the snow, on, a, on an ice, is 15 pounds per square inch, one five, 15 pounds. Dog's paw, Three and a half pounds, mm -hmm. one five, fifteen pounds. Dog's paw, three and a half pounds. Mm -hmm. A man's foot, two and a half pounds, and a man on skis, half a pound mm -hmm. per square inch. Mm -hmm. So the statistic speaks for itself. The horses suffered from the beginning, bitter cold, wet all the time. Not long before the first one died, the second one had to be put down. Each time, fresh meat available. Um, and they then followed the Golden Gateway, which it was then called, which Shackleton saw from the top of the mountain, Mount Hope. Uh, 
ice bridge. The men went over, but then he fell through and was killed. They didn't even find him. Uh, they again left food depots all the way along. When they were about 300 miles from the pole, just over halfway, they realized that they're going too slow, not achieving the 16 miles per day. And the decision was, we have to travel fast. How are we going to do it? We must travel lighter. So they left a lot of stuff behind and made a dash for the pole, with, of course, serious risks. Um, Christmas Day, they were 550 miles from 500 feet already. Now that's very interesting to note. From the coast, it was a climb all the way from zero up to 3,000 or more meters. It is incredible the climb that they had to do. They were doing about nine and a half miles per day instead of 16. <coughs> but the marshal knew better. He said, we can't. Uh, they then had a discussion. And Shackleton agreed, all right, let's go for just under 100 miles from the pole. That is something to achieve. Then we can turn around. And that's what they did. So they turned at 97 miles from the pole, turned at 97 miles from the pole, and started their return journey. Uh, now, the return journey, they traveled faster and lighter. But what was actually happening because of, their, of all the stuff they left behind, they had to eat less and less. Mm. Of, their, of all the stuff they left behind, they had to eat less and less. Mm. So they were actually starving. They were thinner and weaker every day as they went along. Uh, Dr. Marshall uh, took measurements and they were already four degrees lower than normal body heat, uh, body temperature. Uh, body temperature. Uh, at the height for the last couple of days, because they were so high, they all had uh, altitude sickness, constant headaches. Uh, but they, at least they were on their way back. They already achieved a major goal to get that far south. Uh, only 97 miles from the miles from the pole. So, quite a major achievement. Uh, they were re going already for 88 days, and due to the malnutrition. Uh, they became really weaker and thinner by the day. But, and that's important and interesting to note, to note, no scurvy. So they died. They just made it to the first depot, 40 miles away. Uh, after that, oh no, just before that, before they reached the first depot, I must make mention of that, they were run out of, out of food. So Dr. Marshall fed them cocaine tablets. <laughs> that kept them going for another day. Just to make that keep them going for another day, just to make it to the depot. Quite <laughs> then it was a repetition. Every time a race just to make the next depot. Uh, Shackleton was ill, all of them were starving. Uh, Wild collapsed, one of the guys was starving. Uh, Wild collapsed, one of the guys. Uh, Marshall getting to continue again. But it was really a race against time just to make it to the end. Uh, on the 23rd of February, uh, they made it to the last depot. It would, it would then still be two days. No, it was 33 miles off that point where the ship would pick them up again. But the agreement with the captain of the ship was that he must be there on a specific date, being the 25th of February, can be there earlier, the ship can go. Yes. They have to so they were 33 miles away, two days, to stop the ship from leaving. Yes. Um, Shackleton was by that time, as far as the ship was concerned, already regarded as being dead. He had food for 91 days, uh, so the ship then moved in to send a party to see whether they could find the remains of Shackleton and his party. And at that moment, two of the men who went ahead to fit the stew, Shackleton and Wild, went forward and as they approached Hard Point, the ship just went forward and as they approached Hard Point, the ship just came around the corner. So it was a matter of hours at the end of the day. Um, they returned to New Zealand and the news spread to Europe and Shackleton was an absolute hero. 
Uh, and Shackleton was an absolute hero. Uh, and rightly so. Their achievement was really something very, very special. He was praised by other explorers from right over the world. Amundsen, you will know the name Amundsen, the Norwegian explorer. Scott himself, despite their relationship, well, I suppose he didn't really have a choice, but he said, uh, congratulations, uh, Northern Skilt, Nansen, all around the world, the, the uh, good wishes came in. Shackleton had then to recover some of his debts. Well, as a matter of fact, money was not, a, not important to him at all, it never was. But to do it expeditions, you needed money. And before he left, he had a lot of loans, uh, which had to be repaid. So coming back, he started touring, and he toured literally the world, Europe, uh, and he was appraised for all that he has achieved, but the money was still a problem. Uh, he was knighted, he was now a sir, and people come from far, came from far to come and listen to his, to his lectures. Um, to his, to his lectures. Um, Shackleton, along the way, had quite a few schemes of how to get rich. Um, it's quite incredible to read. He was, he just came upon something and then he thought, well, this is now, this is now the opportunity. He invested money, now this is now the opportunity. He invested money in a, in a company who would start mining gold in Russia. He invested in a company exploring for oil somewhere. And every time, and that is the, the old refrain, he came home and he told his wife, his patient wife at home, Emily, Emily, all our troubles. And never, never materialized. Uh, then from 1910, Shackleton became more and more restless. Now we must bear in mind now if we talk about 1910, if we go back to 1901, the Antarctic expedition of Scott, of which Shackleton was part, um, then the 1907 expedition, which I've mentioned to you now, up to 97 miles from the pole, uh, Scott was 745 miles from the pole, American Robert Peary reached the North Pole. Bit of a, yeah, it was never really uh, unanimously accepted that he has in fact reached the pole, but he claimed to have reached the pole. Then in 1911, that you will know, Amundsen reached the south. That you will know, Amundsen reached the south pole. Mm. Scott also made it after Amundsen, but died on the way back. What else was there to achieve for a polar explorer? Mm. And Shackleton was feeling Time is running out for him. He was getting older, a feeling. Time is running out for him. He was getting older, but the money was still not there. But then he started planning his following expedition, trying everywhere to get some money together, get some sponsors, get got some loans. Uh, and he then was now not only to reach the South Pole, but to cross on Earth. So his aim then was to go back to Antarctica and to be the first man to cross Antarctica shore to shore via the South Pole, uh, which would have been a major achievement again, because now remember all there and back. So on the way there, you leave your depots with food. On the way back, the food is there. Now to cross shore to shore, you have to make provision for double the distance. Uh, so it was not that simple. Uh, to do that, but that was his, his challenge. And one of that, I think going back to Antarctica will make me young again. Mm -hmm. That was what he said. Um, now, if we get to his third expedition, and that is the photograph, no, no, now we can carry on. And that is the photograph, no, no, now we can carry on a bit was the endurance. The ship that he got for his third expedition was the endurance. Uh, he advertised for men to join him on this expedition. And this 
advertisement of his that appeared in the and this advertisement of his that appeared in the newspapers was quite interesting and is quite well known. I'm going to quote to you what he, what his advertisement read. <coughs> Men wanted for hazardous journey. <laughs> Small wages, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, <laughs> <laughs> honor and recognition in case of success. That was, the, that was his advertisement. And he got more than 5,000 applicants. Three were girls. <laughs> Shackleton then planned to sail to Antarctica, but this time to the Weddell Sea. Now, I pointed out to you that where Ross Sea is on this side, the Weddell Sea is on that side, south from the southern tip of South America, the Weddell Sea. So he wanted to sail to the Weddell Sea, and then from there to the South Pole, and from the South Pole to Ross Sea, that was the plan. That would be the, the expedition. Um, a, few um, a few comments about the Endurance. Endurance was a, was a fine ship, beautiful ship, uh, had a 30, 350 horsepower steam engine, wooden hull, between 18 inches and 2, wooden hull, between 18 inches and 2 and a half feet thick. The hull, wooden hull. Uh, at the bows, the sides were 4,4 feet thick. Strong ship. Um, it is believed that it is the second strongest wooden ship of Munson. Second strongest ship that was ever built. Um, now, Endurance was also a, was a barcantine. It's also a three masted ship. But only the foremast is square rigged, square sails. The main mast and the rear mast and the aft mast sails front to back. Raising the money was again a huge challenge. But as Shackleton was, he made plans and he get, got some money together. Many loans. And one of the loans was on the basis that the book that he would have written afterwards would be for this uh, sponsor of his, for his benefit. He then left England, sailed for Buenos Aires, Argentina. Something interesting happened there. After they left Argent uh, uh, Buenos Aires, three, three days or four days after sea, they discovered the stowaway. Uh, somebody that wanted to discover the stowaway. Uh, somebody that wanted to do the expedition. It was brought before Shackleton, and Shackleton said, if we run out of food and someone has to be eaten, it will be you first. <laughs> to be eaten, it will be you first. <laughs> right. They went to South Georgia. That was the final stop before leaving for Antarctica. Now, those of you who attended my previous address about my trip to Antarctica will remember. I will just say again, one of the most beautiful places in the world, if not the most beautiful. An island about 170 kilometers long, at the broadest 225 uh, kilometers wide, uh, lying more or less northwest to southeast. It's one of the Antarctic islands, uh, which became known in Indian, and after all the seals were, were killed for whaling. So along the northeast coast of South Georgia, were at the stage when Shackleton went south, there were quite few whaling stations still in operation. Now, why on the northeast coast? The prevailing winds is totally inaccessible. Stormy seas right through the year from the west. And on the northern side, you will see quite few sheltered bays. So all the whaling stations were in those bays. So Shackleton sailed with the Endurance to South Georgia, that was their last stop, to the whaling captains asking about the conditions of the South Sea, specifically the Weddell Sea, and getting in, uh, well, quite valuable information. But it was more bad news than good news, because that specific year, the Weddell Sea 
uh, and even further north had a lot of ice Arctic over the ship. Um, from South Georgia, now we're talking about, let get my dates right again, uh, 1914. From South Georgia, they sailed south to the Weddell Sea. On deck, they had 69 in the Weddell Sea. On deck, they had 69 huskies to pull sledges, not horses. Uh, tons of coal and one ton of boiled meat, which hang from the rigging as food for the dog. From the rigging as food for the dog, with blood dripping all over the deck. <laughs> Apparently, like quite a mess. Uh, they made good progress all the way south, but when entering the Weddell Sea, uh, they came upon drift ice. Weddell Sea. Uh, they came upon drift ice, and not long after that, pack, pack ice. Very, very long before they reached the point where they wanted to go. Namely, in the they wanted to get to the southeastern side. They wanted to get to the southeastern side of the Weddell Sea. This is the Weddell Sea. They wanted to get to the southeastern side and start their trek from somewhere around there, south. But far north, they were already in, in pack ice. They tried to work their work, their way through the ice. They tried to work their work, their way through the ice, succeeded for a few days, and it all depended on the wind. If there was strong southerly wind blowing, the, and the ice sort of opened up. But now you can imagine, with strong northerly winds, all the ice was forced into the and that's unfortunately what they experienced. Very strong gales from the north. Um, they carried on until the 16th of January. Then in heavy pack ice, they were still 200 miles from their destination, where they would have wanted to offload, pack the ice all around them. Uh, by the 24th of January, endurance was completely beset in the ice. <coughs> Only a southerly gale would then have saved her. Um, what could they do? Got off the ship, hunted seals to get some more fresh meat, hunted seals to get some more fresh meat again. Uh, they still tried for about a month until <coughs> towards the end of February, tried to free her, uh, literally sawing away the ice around the ship. Uh, if there was a bit of movement, try to make progress a few meters, but by the end uh, if there was a bit of movement, try to make progress a few meters, but by the end of February, they realized it was a no-go, and they would have to overwinter on the ship in the middle of the Weddell Sea. Now, what is interesting about the Weddell Sea is the prevailing winds, the prevailing winds in the southern seas, as I mentioned to you last time, is strong winds from west to east, west to east all the way around Antarctica, from the west to the east, which can also lead to very strong sea current through the Drake Passage between the southern tip of South America, Cape Horn, strong, now interesting, easterly current. The wind is called from the Drake's direction where it comes from, the current, sea current, according to the direction where it's flowing. So it's an eastern current, but a westerly wind, but in that direction. In the Weddell Sea, with all the drift ice, uh, with a current in the northern, that all the ice is slowly drifting clockwise, going up, wind catches it, the current catches it, going to the east, a lot of the ice up into the Scotia Sea, some of the ice coming back again, and there's this movement all the way around, right through the year. So what the men on, they were drifting in a southwesterly direction. And as the months went on, in fact, they were beset in the ice for nine months, during which time they drifted initially southwest, later west, later to the northwest, in this packed ice of um, Sweden. They then also used the time as from April, starting to train the dogs again, Hopefully this time with more success. 
Um, early May, uh, the sun disappeared for the last time. For the next 120 days, more or less, we would never see the sun again. And by June, July, it was permanent pitch dark. Temperature dropped. Uh, weather changed, it's interesting, not stormy weather all the time. Weather changed, it's interesting, not stormy weather all the time. In between that, beautiful clear sky, and nice weather, but then the next storm or okay, hit again. Uh, 22nd of June, they celebrated Midwinter's Day and had a huge concert, a lot of fun, a lot of laughing. After that, by a huge concert, a lot of fun, a lot of laughing. After that, by the 9th of July, the barometer started to fall for five days continuously. And then, as they expected, a major storm picked up. The effect of that was that the ice in which they would be set started to break up. And that was not good news. This huge, thick layer of ice breaking up uh, was a major threat to the ship. She no longer was just be set safely in the ice. It was now pieces of ice drifting towards her, raining her from all sides. Uh, the ice was flat, now all of a sudden it was breaking up and pieces went up into the air and it pushed against the ship. On the 1st of August, there was a tremble, scraping and grinding sounds uh, and all of a sudden the ship, the ship bow was lifted out of the ice. Uh, Still the sprint was good, the ship lasted, everything looked fine. Uh, end of August, uh, endurance began to creak and groan like a haunt, haunted house, that is what's said. There was movement in the ice, uh, but endurance still survived. The rising, the men, or the men were positive, uh, they hoped that they will still be able to carry on. Uh, but the ice opened a bit, but then closed again. Uh, they thought the battle was won, but by the 22nd of you know by now that is bad news, strong wind blew and the ice in the Weddell Sea, the pressure just became more and more and more. Uh, and then it started to happen. First the stern post of the endurance was torn away, uh, they started the engines to get the pumps was torn away. Uh, they started the engines to get the pumps running, pump out the water, the water was streaming in, engines was, were started, uh, but as they pumped, the water froze, pumped the water out. They tried hand pumps, they tried everything, they built coffer dams in the, in the hand pumps, they tried everything, they built coffer dams in the, in the hull to try to seal off the, the, uh, the water that was pouring in. Uh, they had a battle for about two and a half days and then realized that it was all for nothing they had to give up. And that is the piece with which I've started my was all for nothing they had to give up. And that is the piece with which I've started my, my address this, uh, this morning. Uh, on the 27th of October at 5 p.m. the order was given to abandon ship. I spent the first night on the ice in tents. Uh, I spent the first night on the ice in tents. Uh, there's a long story about that first night as well, we don't have time for that. Uh, then it was decided that they would march over the ice in a northwesterly direction towards Paulette Island. Now why Paulette Island? There was a shipwreck there some... Now why Paulette Island? There was a shipwreck there some 10 years earlier, around about uh, 1904 and some stores were left behind on that island and Shackleton knew that. Could they make it to Paulette Island, they will have fresh food again and they could make contact with what say. But now they would reach open water somewhere, they're now on the, embedded in the ice and they're drifting, but same, somewhere as they go north they will have open water again. So they also had to drag boats along. So three, initially two, later they fetched another one, three Boats from Endurance, day by day by day, for the day when they will reach open water and they had to sail again to get to the next island. Uh, that was extremely hard work, uh, and after a week or so they gave up. They just realized it's, it's 
Stauplus. Rechts als weit unter Eis, bei A drifting more or less in the right ice, bei A drifting more or less in the right direction. So they settled the game. Uh, by that time, uh, somewhere, I can't give you the date immediately, but the endurance sank and disappeared below the ice. Uh, Shackleton, when they started the march till uh, Shackleton, when they started the march till his, uh, his men that each one can take clothing with some extra clothes, but as far as personal gear is concerned, two pounds each maximum. Because you realize they will have to travel as light as possible. And travel as light as possible. And to prove the point, Shackleton took his golden cigarette box and some other golden wear and threw it away on the ice. He took his Bible and tore out a few pages which he kept and left the Bible on the ice to make the point. Uh, right, with the good hopes of getting close to Paulette Island. But that was a drift they had no control over. So after some time they realized they are going north, way past Paulette Island. So they had to change plan. Then they hoped to reach the tip of the, the Weddell Sea, the tip of the Palmer Peninsula, King George Island. So they hoped that they could reach that. They had the boats, so the water would clear, the ice would clear, and they get close enough to the tip of the peninsula, they can put the boats in the water and sail and row for the for, for past the tip of the peninsula. Then they realized there's one last chance. There are two islands north of the northern tip of the Palmer Peninsula, Clarence Island and Elephant Island. Uh, but they were still in the ice. They kept drifting, they pedaled, and then when they took a, a bearing again after a few days of, of clouded air, overcast weather, when they took a bearing again, sometimes they saw, well, we are now back again, further to the south or to the east. Uh, but they carried on drifting in the ice. Uh, supplies were known. The guys were actually starving again. Uh, then, at some stage, a sea leopard came out of the water. It's like a seal, but spotted it where the name leopard comes from. Uh, a sea leopard came out of the sea and they shot it. And then they had some thousand pounds again of meat and blubber. Then they had some thousand pounds again of meat and blubber. So that was quite a, 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 a welcome outcome that came their way. The flow, the ice started breaking up. It was not one solid piece of ice anymore. So they were on a flow initially about 200, so they were on a flow initially about 200 meters by 100 meters on which they then camped, with their boats of course. But along the way this flow started breaking up and it happened quite a few times that when it started breaking up, some men on that side and some on this side, with one on the tent and one guy fell into the sea and had dragging out of, out of the water. Uh, the conditions, it's unimaginable. Uh, really starving, uh, bad shape, wet all the time, never dry, sleep cold and miserable, and very weak. So when the ice opened, opened up a bit, and Shackleton at last decided, now we must get on the boats, he gave the order. Uh, they couldn't sail yet, they had to row, but the men were not in very good shape to row. But the row just in, these tiny little boats would have been slapped like a, like a match. So they had to row, uh, try to get out. I see my time is running out, I'll make it short. Um, when they could, they hoisted the sails, they had favorable winds for a couple of days, then he turned north again. Very, very happy, but, there was a big but, and I've experienced it myself. If you, between the ice, the sea is flat. Once you're out of the ice in the open sea, it's rough, it's huge waves, it's, it's, it's a stormy sea. So they were out of the ice, very little relief, but they were hit by enormous waves. Terrible, more or less from behind, they sailed north, hoping to get to Clarence Island, aiming for Clarence Island. Then the wind shift completely to the northeast again. Then they decided, now we must try for King Edward, for uh, 
from George Island again. So they sailed to the north southwest, then the wind toward Island again. So they sailed to the north southwest, then the wind toward turned north again. <coughs> then they decided to change of plans to try for Elephant Island. And that we picked up to gale force, but they managed to get to Elephant Island sailing there in this absolute gale. Uh, sailing there in this absolute gale. Uh, but just as a last, what shall we call it, slap in the face, just before they got to Elephant Island, the wind turned again, strong northwesterly, late afternoon, around 5 o'clock, and then the whole night, they had to battle through the night, around 5 o'clock, and then the whole night, they had to battle through the night, and the next morning at dawn, they were able to sail into a little bay at Elephant Island, at last on solid ground again. An absolute, absolute miracle. If you know anything about the Antarctic waters, the sea condition miracle. If you know anything about the Antarctic waters, the sea condition, the ice, the bitter cold and sailing, you will realize, or you will agree with me, that an absolute, absolute miracle. But having arrived on Elephant Island, there was no rescue yet. Elephant Island was no rescue yet. It was a piece of rock uh, with nothing. A narrow little beach uh, and the sea at, at high came in right up to the rocks which went thousand meters up. The better place, which they did, almost were blown out to sea by a, an offshore gale again, but they got to the next bay about seven miles from there where conditions were better as far as they could be above the high water mark, but with no shelter whatsoever. But they made it to there. And then came the announcement from... There was food, there were seals, there were penguins. They could eat, they could survive. There was a glacier, so there was fresh water. They could survive, but they couldn't get out. So what next? Then Shackleton announced that himself and five men would take the best of the three boats and sail back to South, South Georgia. South, South Georgia. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is through the Drake Passage, the most notorious sea in the world, where those permanent gale force or storm winds from the west, uh, some 800, 850 miles from where they were. 850 miles from where they were. Uh, they had three options. The one option was sail to Cape Horn, the southern tip of South America. That was quite a bit closer, about half the distance, but against the prevailing winds. One other option was sail to uh, one other option was sail to uh, what's the name of the other islands? Uh, with, uh, the Argentinian island, Falkland, Falkland Islands. Also, not with the wind from behind. Much closer, but not good winds. So he made the decision, he doubled the distance, but he downwind to South Georgia. The carpenter, McNish, then uh, worked on the James Caird, the best of the three boats, he made it quite a bit higher on the sides, took some of the sledges to put planking over, and then they covered the whole boat with uh, seal skins to make it, uh, did some improvement as far as they could, and as soon as possible, Shackleton and five more men uh, embarked and sailed away. It was April already, so the winter was approaching fast. Mm. Now they sailed for South Georgia Island, 800 miles away, and a little limited navigation equipment. Uh, not, they not equipped at all, rotten sleeping bags, not the correct gear to sail with. Uh, about 22 foot boat. 22 feet, people, that's nothing. It's a little dinghy. Uh, but the navigator on board the ship as well, Shackleton took him with because his calculations and his navigating would be of the utmost value. Worsley, whenever the, clear, the skies opened for a few minutes, took some bearings on the stars or the sun and kept them as best as he could for South Georgia. Um, on the way there, oh, I should also make mention, to make the boat more stable, they put half a ton of rocks in the boat. 
<laughs> so where they had to move and had to sleep, they had to climb over rocks all the time. Uh, on the way, they realized through a blizzard they were sailing through the time. Uh, on the way, they realized through a blizzard they were sailing through that uh, Shackleton thought, what's wrong? The boat was trying to, uh, starting to act very differently, very sluggish. So there was all the ice that was packing onto the sides of the boat, made it top heavy. It have turned turtle, so that used the axe just to get all the ice made it top heavy. It could have turned turtle, so that used the axe just to get all the ice off again. Keep going. Then, after another storm, they realized they must approach elephant, they must now approach South Georgia, that island, which they had here. But were they on track? Nobody knew. There were the clouds open for a while. Dead end. So there was Elephant Island. That was another major medical because bear in mind, should they miss the island, should they go past it, there was no way of turning back. They couldn't sail back into the into the wind. And going past South Georgia, they would be in the South Atlantic with no more land ahead for thousands and thousands of miles until they would get to Australia after a year or so. Uh, so there was really there was only one only one chance. And there they made it. Uh, <coughs> but when they got to King Harpon Bay that day, going ashore there is a different story altogether. They were half wrecked by huge waves and strong winds from behind, but they landed in King Harpon Bay with all the whaling stations and the only human beings on the northeastern side of the island. And yeah, luckily the last challenge. To get over the mountains to civilization. Shackleton took two men with him, the other three were left behind here. And Shackleton and two men, the three of them, started on foot over the island at that stage, none of South Georgia. Uh, they didn't have proper boots to walk, their clothes were in pieces, uh, they didn't have any mountaineering gear, they just had one rope of 50 feet long, that's all they had. Uh, they didn't have proper backpacks they could put on, but the three started. Uh, they didn't have proper backpacks they could put on, but the three started out and they started climbing. Now the mountains of South Georgia, <coughs> just to give you an idea of that. Okay, that's now on the ice with endurance. Endurance broken ice with endurance. Endurance broken down and sinking. There on this map you can also see what I've explained earlier, the movement coming from South Georgia towards the Weddell Sea, this is the Weddell Sea, uh, towards the Weddell Sea, this is the Weddell Sea, uh, it enters the pack ice and from there on drift with the pack, drift with the pack, drift with the pack, crushed finally and sunk carry on drifting, drifting, putting the boats in the water, uh, carry on drifting, drifting, putting the boats in the water, uh, and there is Elephant Island. From Elephant Island, the sail to South Georgia. Now what I wanted to show to you here, if you talk about South Georgia Island, that was pulling the boats over the ice, arriving at Elephant Island, you see what I'm pulling the boats over the ice, arriving at Elephant Island, you see what I meant about the Nature of the island, a very shallow, very narrow little beach, and then the cliffs. Um, that is the launch of the James Care. Now, that specific photograph is for me personally, but I'm going to make an enlargement of it. I'm going to frame it and put it up in my study. That attempt with that little boat to sail 800 miles to the Drake Passage to South Georgia is, in my view, one of the most remarkable achievements by mankind ever. Really, very, very special. At the waiting station, there's a museum, a little museum, uh, specifically about Shackleton, mainly, and this is an exact replica of the James Care with which they have sailed. Quite mm. interesting to see what the boat looked like. Uh, I have then, you will, some of you will remember this photograph, that was my previous uh, address to you about our, our trip to South to uh, Antarctica. I've taken a few of my photographs 
to show to those of you who it was not at the previous uh, meeting, just to show the nature of South Georgia. Mountains of South Georgia. Mountains, glaciers, thousands of penguins, but those were the mountains that Shackleton and his two members, fellow men, had to cross. Glaciers, icy water, very high mountains. Glaciers, icy water, very high mountains. Here we were also at the foot of one of the glaciers. But look at the mountains. The mountains are almost the height of the Alps in Europe. Uh, some of the peaks reach to the height of the Matterhorn. And those were where the three men had to go. Right. Um, despite all the factors against them, they crossed the mountains, uh, killed themselves quite a few times narrowly, had to turn around to, uh, and late afternoon at about five, four or five o'clock, they were on top of one of the mountains and had to get down. Very, very steep, all iced up, thick ice and thick fog couldn't see anything down. They started using their little hammer for about half an hour. And then Shackleton realized, well, this is not going to work. So he told these two fellow mates, said, listen, I've got another plan now. We're going to hook in behind each other, make a train, lift our feet, and slide down. <laughs> their response was, not see anything in the fog. It could be cliffs. We don't know. So his, Shackleton's response was, you were right, but if we stay here, mm -hmm. if we go down at this pace, we are gonna, we're all going to freeze to death tonight. If we slide down, we've got a 50-50 chance. <laughs> so they said that, and they went down faster and faster and faster and faster, but luckily at the end the slope levels out. <laughs> and at the bottom, they were not too far from uh, Stromnes. Uh, Stromnes is where the waiting station is, today still there. There's Stromnes Whaling Station. So when they went today still there, there's Stromnes Whaling Station. So when they went over this last mountain, they went into that bay. It's part of uh, uh, Stromnes Bay and they walked the last few kilometers to the whaling station. Um, when they arrived there, the men didn't want to believe them. Um, when they arrived there, the men didn't want to believe them. And they told the story, but then he went to the manager of the whaling station, which person, uh, a Shackleton person he knew, and then they realized that he's really Shackleton and his men. Um, now, three men were still in Hackenham Bay. Uh, 22 men were still left behind at Elephant Island. Shackleton sent a boat around to King Hackenham Bay within a day or two, picked up the three men there, uh, brought them to from this uh, wedding station, but then it took him more than four months to get suitable boats. Britain was in war, it was the First World War. Yes. No resources, no help from outside. He then uh, started speaking to the Chilean government. Uh, he got a boat, tried to fetch them in, but it was midwinter, it was not sufficient, couldn't get through the ice. So it took him more than four months uh, from Elephant Island. Um, the beauty of this story is that of the 28 men, stowaway included, that left from Buenos Aires, all of them returned. Yeah. Not one, not one that was left behind or died. Back home, uh, it was war, it was difficult times, money wasn't there. Shackleton again tried to keep going, lecturing, telling his story, showing the photographs. Um, but he realized that, and he said, I must go back to Antarctica one more time. But now, um, the, the last chapter is unfortunately not a happy one. Um, he just got enough money together to organize another expedition, uh, 1920. And in 20 he sailed 1920. And in 20 he sailed from Britain, in a small little boat, oh, I must just 
tell this story first. This is when the ship arrived at Elephant Island and all the men on shore. You can imagine how happy they must have been. Mm. By then they believed that Shackleton didn't make it. Yeah. Must have been. Mm. By then they believed that Shackleton didn't make it. Yeah. So the only conclusion was that we stuck here for <coughs> indefinitely. And then the ship came in and that was a photograph taken by one of the men uh, with a little boat coming to pick them up. Rowing out to the ship. Shackleton's fourth journey. The best vessel that he could get was that little ship Quest. And he sailed to Antarctica with that ship. Quest. And he made it all the way to South Georgia. South Georgia was again to be the last port before. Now, the not so good health of Shackleton didn't improve. To the contrary, he had problems with chest pains, short of breath. Uh, on the way there in Buenos Aires, the doctor suspected that he in fact had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. But again, Shackleton refused at Great uh, Viken, it's another Norwegian waiting station at Great Viken. During the night, he had a fatal heart attack and he died on the 5th of January 1922. Uh, this last expedition, uh, I've got some opinion expedition. Uh, I've got some opinions about it. Shackleton collected as many of his crew, of his party on the endurance ex expedition with him, on this expedition. I had serious doubts whether Shackleton really, I had serious doubts whether Shackleton really thought that he would ever cross Antarctica. It came out in that uh, biography about him that when he was still a youngster, a doctor told him, you will not reach the age of 48. And he did this last expedition, you will not reach the age of 48. And he did this last expedition when he was 47. And then there's a lot of, a few things that also just came up. When they sailed from Britain, it was thick fog and one of the, uh, on the sea, some of the uh, navigational boys have got signals. The, uh, Navigational boys have got signals, and if, this, if, if there's fog and there's some movement in the ocean, this one specific boy had a very sad wailing song or tune. And Shackleton mentioned to one of his uh, crew members, "This is my, this is my death." Mentioned to one of his uh, crew members, "This is my, this is my death song." Yeah. So it seems as if Shackleton knew that he didn't have long to go. Uh, on the way there, they stopped at all the old familiar landmarks. Uh, Fortuna Bay, uh, uh, Stromness Bay, Memory Lane, for old times sake. It looked like that. Um, now, he died financially bankrupt, literally. When he died, his estate was totally bankrupt. Uh, most of the creditors, however, uh, didn't claim their crops. My note here is, but he left a legacy uh, equaled by very few men. I thought what I should say in the final analysis. Uh, I think I've got a good understanding of what he and his men through uh, being there myself. But I endured on our ship, the Europa, many Better cold nights on watch and on the wheel. So I've got an idea of it. Maybe that's why it's so such a personal matter for me, this whole story of I was dry, I had good clothing. So I then thought, I'm not the person to have the last comment. I don't think I will do justice. So I want to quote what Amundsen said after Shackleton's death. Now Amundsen, you will remember, he's Norwegian. I admire in the highest degree what Shackleton and his companions achieved with the equipment they had. Bravery, determination, strength they did not lack. Little more experience could have crowned their work with huge success. Could have crowned their work with huge success. Sir Ernest Shackleton's name will forever 
be engraved with letters of fire in the history of Antarctic exploration. Courage and willpower can make miracles. I know of courage and willpower can make miracles. I know of no better example than what that man has accomplished. After his death, his remains were shipped to Buenos Aires with the idea back to England. But then the message, when the ship was in Buenos Aires, the message came in from Shackleton's wife, Emily. Now, that is quite an interesting instruction. The instruction was, go and bury him on South Georgia. That's where he always wanted to be. <laughs> so then, Ernest Henry Shackleton, explorer, born 15th of February 74, entered life in turn of January 1922, at Great Deacon Whaling Station in the cemetery for the whalers and the sealers. And that is where he, his remains rest. Now I don't want to end a beautiful story, so I end with two very beautiful photographs, and that is something quite interesting. Uh, despite the instruction that each man can only take two pounds of personal belongings with him, uh, Shackleton had the foresight to allow his photographer to take his cameras with. And thanks to that, because of their endurance and their journey thereafter. And I end with my favorite, this one. On the ice, endurance, after she was beset in the ice, after the old state when you can see the ice breaking up, now you can imagine those ice flows pressing in with a gale behind. I thank you ladies and gentlemen.